right, good morning, everybody. Good Thank you. Uh, my name is Rick Perra, and it's my pleasure to sort of give you a little progress update on the ultra short pulse laser matter interactions portfolio. And let me start by saying that this portfolio is really focused on one of the most fundamental processes in nature, that of the interaction of light with the basic constituents of matter. So we're talking about protons, electrons, neutrons. And it's the interaction not just of any light, but light that comes out of an ultra short pulse laser. Now, by way of introduction, let me start by telling you about a light that we are very familiar with, sunlight. If I take sunlight and I pass it through a prism, uh, we get, you know, it's full of colors. We see colors from the ultraviolet, the visible, the infrared, and you know, beyond that. And in fact, if you look at sort of the spectral components of this light, you see that there's no phase relationship between them. It's incoherent. And what I mean by that is if you look at sort of the crests of each of these colors, they just don't line up. So on, on a detector, you would see sort of an average power, albeit a little noisy. If I now look at another source of light, a light emitting diode, a red LED in this case, we see that the bandwidth is significantly smaller. It's about 40 times smaller than the case of the sun. Still incoherent, which means that the crests still don't line up. But now I have sort of a less noisy average power on my detector. If I now look at a, a traditional uh, laser, such as a helium neon laser, the, the type that how we just talked about, we see that the bandwidth is significantly smaller. It's now about 10,000 times shorter than the case of the LED. And because of the lasing process itself, uh, it's very coherent, which, which means now that all the crests and the troughs all line up, and you get a very stable average power coming out of this. If I now look at light coming out of a so-called mode-locked femtosecond laser, you see something completely different, something remarkable. In fact, it looks a lot closer to the case of the sun rather than the case of sort of the laser, or the traditional laser. You see that you get hundreds of nanometers of bandwidth. Uh, in this case, in the sort of infrared and, uh, and the near-infrared. Uh, but because it is a laser, it is coherent, which means that there is a phase relationship between the, the spectral components. And in this case, what that means is that there's going to be a couple of spots where these crests sort of line up. Here we see in this illustration two spots. Uh, and the, the energy will sort of constructively interfere. Because you have different wavelengths, though, everywhere else it will destructively interfere. Uh, and you won't get anything there. So by way of looking at the output, you see what you, what you get is that all the energy is actually confined to extremely short pulses in, in time. Now, how short can you make these? Uh, we can make them as short as 5 femtoseconds. So by way of context, you know, 5 femtoseconds is to 1 second, roughly what the duration of, of my talk today is to sort of the age of the universe. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so mode lock femtosecond uh, lasers are very much at the core of my portfolio. We want to leverage three unique properties that they have, primarily access to high peak powers, uh, access to extremely short pulse width, and access to broadband bandwidth. Now, ultra short pulses, they, um, they have quite a bit of util utility demonstrated across a whole bunch of application spaces. If you can understand and you can manage your bandwidth, that opens up a whole bunch of uh, precision metrology applications. If you can understand and manage your time scales, that allows you to sort of isolate specific physics of interest. Uh, if you understand how these things propagate in air, it allows you to work at range. We are the Air Force, after all. Uh, and if you can understand sort of the peak power, the electric field, that allows you to essentially convert from your infrared photon to just about any other sort of photon energy, as well as actually create particles. Uh, and once you have these particles, you can actually doubly leverage your electric field gradient to accelerate these particles to very, very high energies on spa space scales that are 10,000 times smaller than conventional uh, accelerators. So here, this is my. Um, a list of applications, not meant to be read right now, but sort of for your offline reference, uh, where these things have been useful. So as you can imagine, then my portfolio sort of splits up very naturally into three thrusts. The first one is high field laser physics, which explores, again, the intensity. Uh, uh, frequency combs, which explores the, the bandwidth. And then out of second physics, which explores sort of the ultra short. Uh, the portfolio has seen uh, continued growth since its debut in 12. And currently, the extramural portion of the portfolio is made up of a whole bunch of sort of single investigator grants, a number of basic research initiative grants, and most recently, a MURI. So, so with that, what I'm going to do now is I'm simply just going to go through each one of these sections and then just highlight uh, a couple of uh, interesting sort of um, research 
topics. So I'll start by telling you about the work that Jim Gord does at AFRL RQ. Uh, Jim has been, has been using these lasers for quite some time now to do spectroscopy to look at the chemistry of reacting flow. So we're talking about combustion. And Jim would love to be able to look inside an engine such as this one and measure things like pressure, temperature, uh, species concentration. Uh, in fact, he would like to measure anything he can and ultimately make sort of like high rep rate you know, uh, movies such as the one shown here. And again, if you ask him, he'll tell you that he wants to measure everything everywhere all the time. Uh, and if you know Jim, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so here's one example of some of the work that he's done where they're looking at something called femtosecond two photon excited laser induced fluorescent or TPLIF uh, for short uh, to essentially measure atomic hydrogen. Uh, and atomic hydrogen is an important reactant in combustion and it's one that's actually fairly hard to measure. And the reason it's hard to measure is that it needs essentially a multi-photon excitation to sort of look at that signal. In other words, the single photon transition sits sort of in the UV uh, spectrum. So Jim has been able to essentially leverage these lasers and the huge bandwidths that he has to actually get enhanced excitation on this transition because he can now, by combining a whole number, a large number of photon pairs, so he can essentially take a, a photon from this part of the spectrum and a photon from this part of the spectrum and combine them to essentially get you that transition. So he's actually able to get the entire bandwidth to contribute to the signal. So he can take a, a flame of interest, such as the one shown here, essentially do a line out and actually measure how much hydrogen is being produced uh, in that particular line. Now conventionally, this is done with nanosecond lasers traditionally. Uh, but nanosecond lasers are so much longer, so you actually need a lot higher energy per pulse to be able to excite this transition. So if you were to do the same measurement with, say, a nanosecond laser, you, you'll notice one thing, that as you increase the power to get more signal, you actually create photolytic hydrogen. So your laser beam itself creates hydrogen, so which get, obviously gets in the way of the actual measurement that you're trying to make. So the ability to do multi-photon excitation at very low energy per pulse also allows you to do these measurements at very high rep rates. So here's a, a, a movie, a 2D image of hydrogen being produced, and th this data is being taken at 10 kilohertz. So these, um, what does he click? There we go. So these are truly uh, non-intrusive, interference-free measurements done at very, very high rep rates, uh, kilohertz, which is a three-order of magnitude increase over traditional you know, nanosecond state of the art. It also allows you to measure sort of other critical species like xenon, shown in the bottom left movie. Uh, and you can do sort of quantitative uh, concentration measurements in, in sort of novel flame geometry, such as the cellular flame on the bottom right-hand side. So now I switch gears, and now I'm going to tell you about work being done at Michigan State University. We're now we're going to characterize flow, but this is now non-reacting flow, so there's no combustion. Um, and in this case, this is a project where the PIs are looking to do what they call femtosecond molecular tagging velocimetry, uh, or femto-MTV. And in traditional molecular tagging velocimetry, what you do is you, you, there's a flow of interest. You shine your laser in there. You essentially excite some molecules. You tag them. And in what's essentially a pump probe sort of uh, geometry, you sort of wait some time. And then you take another picture, in this case, two milliseconds later. And you see that the flow has actually moved. And the position, the second position now will tell you something about the velocity, the velocity of that flow element. So this allows you to measure sort of the velocity field of that flow. Now, conventionally, uh, people use sort of single photon transitions to, to look at this, which means people use UV lasers, high power UV lasers with large uh, energy per pulses. Limits, that limits them to low rep rates of 10 hertz or maybe 100 hertz. And because it's in the UV, you now have to worry a lot about you know, UV axis and your mirrors and your lenses and everything that you use. So the group essentially leveraging this, the ability to do multi-photon excitation in the visible at very low uh, pulse rates allow us, allows them to essentially increase the rep rate. So now they can do measurements that are in sort of in the kilohertz to megahertz, which is about one to four orders of magnitude increase depending on which systems you compare. And it allows them to essentially look at MTV type movies uh, essentially in real time. So if I now, so let me say a little more about bandwidth. So if I look at the output of one of these mode lock femtosecond lasers, here shown both in the time domain and in the frequency domain, and if I'm able to sort of stabilize this output, what we see is that in the bandwidth, which is actually made up of a whole bunch of sort of spectral laser modes that are locked together, this bandwidth can actually, um, you can actually make an absolute frequency reference out of this. This is known as an optical frequency comb, and this is of great utility for precision metrology applications. In fact, you know, folks are 
trying to do these uh, optical frequency combs, and they're interested in doing it in smaller and smaller packages. Uh, following up with how we said, here's work that was done um, a while ago looking at sort of whispering gallery mode resonators to create combs. And in, in these systems, the way the combs are generated is somewhat different than in a conventional laser where you have sort of a well-defined cavity, you have a gain medium that you're pumping, and typically you, you do the mode locking via something known as a saturable absorber. In this case, in these uh, whispering gallery mode resonators, you take advantage of the very, very tight light confinement, and you pump it with a single frequency CW uh, beam, and then do do sort of, and you create a whole bunch of frequencies through um, cascaded nonlinear interactions for wave mixing and such, and then you get essentially what looks like a coma frequencies on the output. So about six years ago, people demonstrated this on high Q silica toroids. Since then, they've demonstrated this in a number of different uh, platforms, including silicon nitride micro rings and even millimeter scale high Q crystalline resonators. A lot of experimental progress has happened, uh, culminating essentially in the demonstration of octave spanning bandwidth. So this is bandwidth that's over 100 terahertz of bandwidth. Now. The way the bandwidth is actually created is a little bit intriguing. And in fact, this, the CW pump that we're talking about, uh, if you look closely at what happens, through cascaded four-wave mixing, it generates a number of very, very well-defined comb lines. These are known as sort of a primary lines. And then if you continue to pump this resonator, what actually happens is around each one of these primary lines on the second uh, line, you create a little mini comb around each one of these primary lines. And these are sort of known as sort of type two or secondary lines. And then eventually these fill out and you get a whole bunch of bandwidth, which which looks really good on paper. Uh, however, the problem is that the spacing of these lines, these secondary lines, in general, is not commensurate with the spacing of the primary lines. In other words, it's not a multiple of the other. And this leads to large phase noise. And in general, this bandwidth, you don't see mode locking at all. So normally, even though the, the bandwidth looks great, you actually don't get pulses out. Um, Last year, I showed this slide. This is work from Alex Gaeta at Cornell University, where we were able, uh, he was able to demonstrate a resonator running in, in what looked like to be a low phase, noid, phase noise um, uh, mode, you know, maybe possibly mode locking. And this was demonstrated by the fact that he was able to get sub, for the first time, sub 200 femtosecond pulses out of one of these devices. So this is very interesting. It got people thinking about what exactly is going on in there. There's been quite a bit of effort trying to model these systems. The problem is conventionally modeling these systems is actually computationally very intensive. You're, it's limited to maybe 100 laser modes at most. However, in the last 12 months, in the last year alone, something sort of interesting has happened. Uh, folks have actually rediscovered a model known as the Lugiato Lefervre model, which was actually published back in 1987, which actually fits this particular platform quite well. In fact, it seems to predict very nicely a lot of the experimental results that people are seeing. And it's got the added advantage that it reduces the computational time by a factor of 10,000. So now you can run simulations that, that's looking at the full spatial temporal dynamics of the comb lines and how they're being generated, essentially in 30 seconds on a laptop computer. So what I'm going to show you is a movie that Alex put together um, and sort of just humor me here while I explain this. Well, you're going to see on the left-hand panel, the blue panel, you're going to see temporal evolution in time going vertically. And you're going to see the temporal evolution of the power inside the cavity. So this is one round trip inside the cavity. You notice that the units on the bottom is also time, so don't be confused. But that's really essentially it's space around the cavity. And then on the, on the right-hand side of the blue, that's sort of the, the evolution of the spectrum in time. Um, then on the right side, you'll see a movie where the bottom panel, you'll see that power in the, in, the, in the cavity round trip. The middle pane, you'll see the spectra. And then on the top pane, you'll see a, a laser parameter that we're going to change. And across the simulation, there's going to be three times at 25, 50, and 75 nanoseconds, we're going to tweak a laser parameter, the laser detuning, in fact. So let me turn this movie on. And you see that a couple of things happen. Initially, you turn it on. You get about 23 pulses moving around somewhat stably around the, the cavity. Then you start seeing, when you tune it again, amplitude modulation. Then things get, quote, a little out of whack. You get chaotic-like behavior. Random pulses are generated. But then I turn it up again. And now things seem to kind of stabilize. And pulses seem to combine and, and collide and disappear. And then if I turn it to a very precise value at the very, very end, <laughs> I'm able to suppress all of them except one. And the system then evolves to a single mode lock 32 femtosecond laser pulse. 
Now, this is interesting. You see there's lots of interesting rich dynamics. And you could ask, well, Rick, why don't we simply just tune the laser from the beginning to that last value and, and, and sort of move on? It turns out that if you do that, you don't get any mode locking at all. You don't get any uh, pulses. So it turns out, um, and this is being published right now, that, that you actually have to go through this whole evolution. P particularly, you kind of have to go through this phase two, this chaotic-like behavior, in order for the system to ultimately evolve to the stable mode lock state. So a lot of rich physics, uh, a lot of work to be done. Very interesting. So with that, I'm going to now move, switch gears, and I'm going to talk about sort of the high field science portion of the, uh, of the portfolio. Again, this is exploring the intensity. And, and the, one of the reasons I like this is that if you look at just in the last two decades alone, there's been a six order of magnitude increase in the achieved focused intensities of these tabletop systems. In fact, plotted here is sort of the, uh, the focused intensity uh, on a timeline going all the way back to sort of when the laser was invented. And if I sort of look at this and I start sort of tweaking sort of this intensity, up, roughly about here is where you start seeing the damage thresholds of just about any material. Um, because the laser pulse is much shorter than any thermal process in the materials, uh, this leads to sort of laser ablation, laser machining, where you don't have any debris products, no thermal affected zone, no cracks. And in addition to the very clean machining, which is why people were very interested in this at the beginning, you can actually modify the reflective properties of materials. You can make these colorized um, metals. You can actually induce nanoscale and microscale structures on the surface, which allow you to do things such as make a surface hydrophilic, it likes water, or you can even turn it around and make it hydrophobic, which repels water, and that's shown in these two movies. In general, uh, if you um, irradiate a solid with one of these pulses, you see a whole host of phenomena that occurs ranging on timescales from the femtosecond all the way to the microsecond. There I've shown sort of where the laser pulse would sit on this timescale. There's typically about four regimes that, that people see. You, you Right away you get carrier excitation, you generate a lot of electrons. Um, these very quickly thermalize first with each other th via electron-electron scattering, and that's when you would lose any coherence with the laser pulse that you had. And then they, they thermalize with the, with the lattice through electron electron phonon interactions. And that, that takes place over sort of picoseconds. Eventually, these, things, these carriers get removed, and that lasts for a really long time, uh, going to the microseconds. And then you start seeing these thermal and structural effects from any excess energy that you might have deposited in, in, the, in the lattice. So you see sort of evaporation, ablation, and so forth. So we would love to be able to understand all of these processes, and we would love to see them in real time as they happen. And we have a basic research initiative looking at these laser solid interactions. Here's an example from. Uh, uh, PIs at Ohio State University, sort of illustrating what happens when you actually hit a, a target, a, a little surface, in this case germanium. And one of the things that you see right away is if you look at the very, very center of this picture, you see these little ripples. These have been seen from the very beginning. These are known as laser-induced uh, periodic structures, LIPS. Uh, the uh, conventional wisdom will tell you that these little ripples are sort of wavelength scale, and they are in this case. We're using 3.6 micron light, um, sort of in the mid-infrared. And in fact, these uh, ripples align in a direction perpendicular to the polarization of the laser. So this has been seen. If you now look at the periphery of the beam, you see in sections A and B, you see different structures. These are sort of high frequency um, uh, structures. The wavelengths of these structures is actually seven times smaller than the wavelength of the light that we're using here. And not only that, but they're actually oriented in 90 degrees from, from the lips. They're actually sort of in the direction of the polarization. So a lot of different things. So even though your, your, your beam is smooth, you see different regimes where different things are happening. So we like to understand these things. Now if I go ahead and actually irradiate a different solid, in this case silicon, we see something completely different. And in fact, this is the first time anybody's seen these kind of structures. We're not even sure what we're looking at. Uh, if you look, you can imagine there's sort of these little trenches and maybe little bits of silicon are getting scooped out. Uh, again, this is we just sort of saw these. We don't really have a name for them. That's why I'm calling them sort of novel structures. But we would love to be able to understand the same formalism should tell you what one thing is and versus the other. So the group at OSU is looking to, to do modeling in this, and they've taken an interesting approach. They actually are using a modified PIC code to look at this. Now, this is somewhat uncommon in that PIC codes are typically not used, first of all, not by this community, and not to look at systems like this. They're very uh, good at in plasma physics to model laser interactions in plasma physics. And the reason they're going on this hunch is that, one, they're really good at modeling the, the laser plasma interactions and modeling the electrons. And and it allowed them to essentially 
model realistic target sizes. So in this uh, attempt, they sort of split it up into two steps. They first model the laser matter interactions portion during the first picosecond. Uh, and then they let the target evolve with zero fitting parameters for hundreds of picoseconds. So in fact, here they've let the, the thing run uh, for about half a nanosecond. And in these initial simulations are somewhat encouraging in that they actually see laser morphology, laser damage morpholo morphology, that's on the same spatial scale as those seen by experiments. With again, these are so, to some degree ab initio, zero fitting parameters. And here you see sort of the, the laser damage that they see. So if successful, I think this is going to be a real departure for the field in terms of how they model these. So stay tuned. OK. So now if I go back to, to this picture and I keep on cranking my intensity knob, uh, I start legitimately subsequent uh, interaction. Uh, handling and shun in air. So my, my next example is work out of the University of Maryland, where for a long time they've been looking at the, 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 the propagation dynamics of these filaments. And in this particular work, they're actually looking at what happens after the filament has come by. So not so much the filament, but once it's, it, it's happened. So in this series of, of pictures, you see that the, the, there's a filament that hits at the center. This is sort of the cross section of the beam. The, the plasma that's generated com recombines extremely quickly within 10 nanoseconds. There's, you know, the, these filaments serve to deposit a lot of energy very quickly, sort of like gas density hole that hangs around for milliseconds. Uh, this gas density hole in general acts as a divergent lens. If I was to follow it up with another laser beam, it would act to, to defocus that beam. Um, and they showed this here. I have that lasts a long time. I can now get creative and say put two filaments, and now you see sort of two little pressure waves going out, and that gets neat. Uh, but then you start thinking, well, that's, you know, I can do it with two. Maybe, what if I do four, right? Uh, and of course, that's exactly what they did. That's why I brought it up. Uh, so here you see a, a four-lobed focal beam where they actually are able to, at the focus, excite four filaments. And now they see something sort of interesting. So at very, very You see now gas density, although it's still smaller than the ambient gas, locally it's like a little gas density bump in the sense that it's surrounded by this little moat of low density. So this also serves as a waveguide uh, that now lasts milliseconds long, from microseconds to milliseconds. So this is sort of what they call a thermal waveguide. And of course, here I have a picture. This is experiment where you see the pressure waves go away very quickly. And then you see this little bump in the middle that kind of hangs out for a little while. So of course, you could ask, well, maybe I can use this to um, guide another beam. And in fact, that's exactly what the PIs did. And here they actually demonstrated with about 70% coupling efficiency the guiding of a 7 nanosecond laser pulse. Now this is a high, and this is with about 110 millijoules. So this is a high energy sort of laser pulse uh, that normally wouldn't filament at all. You know, nanosecond are not going to filament on you. So by, by reference, um, this is about, they were able to guide about 100 times more energy than the energy that the filament carries by itself. So this is very interesting. At the time I put the slide together, uh, it was, had not been published. It just got published. 
published a few days ago. So th there should be a credit in there. Uh, so, so very exciting. And, and I think it opens up a lot of interesting possibilities. So I go back to this picture again, and I keep on cranking sort of my magical intensity knob. And at this point, this quiver energy that the electrons got, now it gets faster and faster. And they start uh, moving with relativistic speeds, near speed of light. So now you enter the, the relativistic nonlinear optics regime, as it's called. And you see a whole host of really novel and interesting effects, one of them shown in this movie in the top right hand corner, uh, known as laser wake field acceleration, where literally you can make the electrons uh, essentially serve behind the wake of a laser pulse in a medium, allowing you to accelerate particles on, again, scale lengths that are 10,000 times smaller than conventional accelerators. For reference, you can accelerate to about GeV in a centimeter, which normally you would take, you know, I think you need a kilometer for, for that. So you can also take this laser pulse and hit a solid, such as in the artist's view in the picture on the bottom right. And at that point, you release a, hot, a lot of hot electrons. These hot electrons set up uh, electric um, sheath fields that then rip off protons. So the production of hot electrons is an area of, of high interest because you know, the hot electrons oftentimes dictate what happens afterwards. So we love the electrons. And so here's an example also from Ohio State University where they take their laser, the Scarlet Laser Facility. This is a, a laser that they just recently upgraded to be a petawatt class uh, laser, uh, but uh, 500 terawatts. And they can literally take this laser pulse and hit a target. In this case, a very simple little uh, 100 micron disc. And they get so many x-rays to just come out of this that they can actually take a radiograph of the vacuum chamber from outside of the vacuum chamber. So, so let me explain. What you're seeing here is the radiograph, again, outside of the vacuum chamber. You see on either side, these little circles are the vacuum flanges that are on the outside. So this is going through about an inch of aluminum. And if you look in the center, what you actually see is actually a radiograph of an optical mount that was inside the vacuum chamber. So it's as if you had a sort of a, an x-ray flashlight underneath, and that's what you're taking. So you don't want to be in the room when this pulse goes off. Um, so if you look at the target, you can look at the target in x-ray. You can look at the target in XUV. Um, for reference, there's the target in, in the visible. So again, you get copious amounts of radiation. Um, so in this effort, which is one of our YIPs, we want to ask the question, well, can we move on, rather than using these simple targets, can we use sort of smart targets, engineered targets? So here's, uh, these are 3D PIC code simulations that they've done, where we look at three different geometries. A planar target, which has a little bit of a pre-plasma for technical reasons. Uh, then you have a slab target, B. And then you have sort of this target with these little tower structures at the end. And shown in the plot is sort of the number of electrons in their energy. And you see in the orange curve, if you can see, uh, that you get an incredible increase in the number of extremely hot electrons that you produce in the case with these little tower structures. Uh, in addition, the actual emission of the hottest electrons is actually confined to these very narrow cones. That was not expected. And we're not, uh, so, so that, that's actually very, very, very interesting that this could lead to sort of collimated uh, electron beams. In this 2D uh, movie, you kind of, it sort of illustrates the physics of what's going on. The laser beam actually rips off electrons off the surface of the structures and coherently get, they, they get directly accelerated by the laser, direct laser acceleration over this extended propagation, which is the structure, uh, before any laser defacing nor normally would occur. And then they get all this energy, they get accelerated, and then they get to essentially plunge into the, the, the back of the target. And that's where you would see sort of x-ray productions. So the next step in this effort is to actually do this and actually do the experiment and see sort of what would happen. And again, I, I don't think you want to be in the room when this happens. So stay tuned for an update on that. Uh, here's another effort where we, again, we're going after x-rays, but we're going, we're going to leverage a completely different process known as relativistic Thompson scattering, also known as Compton scattering. And in this particular scenario, you take your laser beam, you actually hit a gas jet, uh, and you, you, via laser wake field acceleration, you create a beam of electrons. And, and, the, uh, and you can do that quite well these days. Then you pick off a little bit of your original laser beam, and you bring it back around, and you backscatter that laser beam off of the electron beam that you just created. So you essentially have sort of this, this photon bullet hitting an electron bullet in midair, and you want to time this very carefully. And if you do this right, you actually upconvert your infrared photon all the way to the x-ray, and you can actually do it all the way to the gamma ray. So two years ago, I briefed this, and, I, and we showed the, the PS were able to demonstrate very, very good control at the generation of monochromatic electron beams all the way. Here they're shown at 60 MeV, but they showed being able to do it all the way to 700 MeV. Uh, and then last year, I briefed this, and they showed that they 
we're actually able to generate gamma rays, MEV class gamma rays. And here's, of course, the mandatory uh, radiograph of the Nebraska N. This is actually half inch thick steel. And this year, in what just got published a few months ago, they were able to show that they can actually tune this in real time. So this is the first demonstration of a truly an all laser driven Compton X-ray source that's both quasi monoenergetic, 50% uh, full width half max, uh, and tunable, going from essentially x-rays, you know, 70 or so kV, continuously all the way to the gamma ray regime to MEV, in a somewhat compact platform, in a tabletop laser. Now, it's a big tabletop, but it's still tabletop. Um, okay. So uh, I put the slide up again one more time to tell you that we still have a little bit of intensity left over in my knob here. And, uh, and we just have, we have a brand new basic research initiative to look at relativistic optics in this regime. So I look forward, hopefully the next year, to brief you on exactly what, what, what happens when you get the most extreme electric fields and what happens to sort of um, uh, matter at that point. So with that, I... Uh, I switch gears one last time. I have a little bit of time left over. And I want to tell you a little bit about a, very, a somewhat small but rapidly growing thrust of the portfolio, which is on out of second physics. So this is essentially asking the question, exploring the ultra short, and asking the question, how short can I make an electromagnetic uh, pulse? So uh, here are some time scales for reference. You know, our intuition sort of uh, lives sort of up there in the top left, you know, at seconds and sort of milliseconds. And in fact, uh, the, our desire to sort of create these very short uh, um, pulses really is driven by our desire to kind of freeze motion at these time scales. And dating all the way back to like the late 1800s, people were interested in doing this, to freeze motion at the millisecond, at the microsecond. Now we're interested in scale lengths that are all the way on the right hand side of this graph in the femtosecond and the attosecond. The femtosecond is the natural time scale for atomic motion on, on sort of the molecular scale. So this is, you know, atoms move, this is the making and breaking of chemical bonds. Uh, however, the attosecond regime this is the natural time scales for the actual electrons to move around sort of in their space. Um, so back in 2001, a little bit over 10 years ago, uh, researchers were, for the first time created late light pulses that were truly in the, in the attosecond regime with the hopes of freezing motion on that time scale. Now, how do you actually produce this? Uh, real brief, you, you take advantage of a process known as high harmonic generation, whereby you essentially have a driving laser pulse shown in red here. You have a, a an electron in a, you know cozy in its in its uh, coulomb potential, and under the influence of the of the laser field, it sees an oscillating coulomb potential, and at some point you, you can actually get the electron to tunnel out, get energy from the laser field, and then when the field reverses, this coulomb potential flips uh, sides, and that electron gets to sort of come back and essentially slam back into its parent atom, and the energy that it got from the electric field, it can convert it into a photon that's either X UV or X rays. Now, this looks really easy to do on PowerPoint. However, the reality is a little different. It's, it's kind of tricky. And in fact, if you look at sort of various sort of trajectories of, that these electrons follow, it's not uncommon for the electron to come out and never come back. It just goes away. Sometimes it, it goes out and then sort of turns around. But then on the way back, it misses the parent atom entirely. Uh, so in fact, even though you have a femtosecond driving field, there's only a very, very small window of time where you can really sort of time it right, where you get the electrons to get the maximum energy and actually coincide and, and sort of go back home, if you will. So with careful sort of engineering of your driving laser field, you can actually uh, create a single isolated out of second to come out. In 2008, uh, researchers demonstrated essentially an 80 out of second uh, pulse. It made it into the Guinness Book of World Records at the time. <laughs> yes, they did that. And, uh, and since then, actually, the records have been broken. So the record now sits at 67 uh, out of seconds at the University of Central Florida. Now, if you have uh, such a light pulse, what do you do? Well, now you can look at some really interesting fast dynamics. And one of the things that people do is look at electric fields, very fast electric fields. So I show this example merely to illustrate the way the community does experiments today. This is sort of the state of the art electron spectroscopy. And the way you, what you really do here, you take your uh, out of second pulse shown here in blue at the center. And there, there may be some electric field of interest that you want to say sample. And you put a, a background gas of, of of, of atoms, and as this um, attosecond pulse sweeps past the field, it, ionize, it photoionizes electrons from the background atoms, and then these electrons, much like sort of um, uh, iron filings would align under the influence of a magnetic field, these electrons are going to sort of align and get momentum shifts, 
based on the electric field that they see. So at points where the electric field is high, they get a nice little high kick. At points where the electric field is low, they get a smaller kick in different directions. So if I kind of go in and put little electron detectors on either side, I can do this sort of electron spectroscopy, and I can actually directly measure the influence of this electric field. So here's an example where you actually measure the electric field of a visible laser. Again, no instruments generally do this. You measure the intensity profile. Here they're actually measuring the electric field. So this is the equivalent to a petahertz oscilloscope. Um, now, electron spectroscopy is actually fairly difficult to do. It looks easy on PowerPoint again. Uh, it's time consuming. It's hard to make these measurements. It takes a long time. So this is work by uh, P.I. Paul Corkum from Canada, who in this particular, he's been doing out-of-second physics for a long time. But in this particular grant, he's motivated to essentially simplify out-of-second metrology, to make it you know, more accessible to a wider audience. So he's developed a, a number of all optical techniques that essentially uh, do away with the whole electron spectroscopy spectroscopy process. And in fact, one of the problems with electron spectroscopy is that it tends to average, the sample that you're looking at, it, it, it spatially averages this. So Paul has uh, devised sort of all optical techniques. It's, it's easy to implement. It's easy to make measurements, to make measurements fast. And it doesn't suffer from this uh, spatial averaging uh, problem. So uh, a few months ago, they actually showed that they were actually able to measure for the first time ever what this at a second pulse actually looks like, both in space and time. So this was sort of the first picture of an attosecond pulse, in this case and in the near field. So this is at the point of creation in the gas jet. And then this thing will propagate. Uh, and, and they can actually measure in the far field as well. So this is what sort of these things look like. They're not quite as pretty as we thought they would look like. In fact, you see strong spatial temporal modulations. Uh, and in fact, this made the cover of Nature Physics uh, actually last March. Now, you can take these, these all optical techniques and turn around and do exactly what we did a slide ago, which is, hey, well, can I measure electric fields? And in fact, you can do it very easily. And here's an example uh, published recently where they demonstrated, again, an all optical, in this case, petahertz oscilloscope, where they measured, they com completely characterized the waveform of, of a 800 few cycle laser pulse as we tune the carrier envelope phase. And you can see a little movie where as you tune the, the CEP, you can actually measure that almost real time. Now, uh, lastly, and this is my last slide. Um, the, using these all optical techniques, they now demonstrated an all optical gating technique known as out of second lighthouse. So one of the things that I glossed over is that it's, it actually is fairly easy to create a train of out of second pulses. What's hard, what's technically hard in the field is actually isolating one of these pulses and using that one. So using this technique, Paul essentially uh, induced a, a laser wavefront rotation at the, at the focal spot of this gas jet. And what this does, it essentially allows you to map time here here to angle and then in the far field to space. So different times here correspond to different positions in space. And by properly aperturing over here, you can now create a single isolated pulse out of a pulse train, uh, making it very easy to do this. Uh, and moreover, what's interesting is that now you can start thinking about doing out of second physics in spectral regimes where currently there are no gating mechanisms, like in the mid infrared, for example. So with that, uh, I'm going to conclude by reminding you what we're trying to do here. We really want to leverage sort of these key properties of ultra short pulse lasers to develop hopefully new capabilities in the generation of radiation, in non-thermal directed energy, uh, materials processing, ultra short diagnostics, and precision metrology. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? There's a break coming up, I guess. So, okay. Thank you.